Welcome to Talk Tantra to Me. It is such an honor to be holding space for this divine knowledge to make its way into your ears and lifestyle. Today, I talk Tantra with James McRae. He is the voice behind Words Are Vibrations and is the author of Shit Your Ego Says. I am so grateful for his content and so appreciative that he is here on the podcast to offer his perspective of living an expansive life. So thank you for being here, James. Why don't you start by telling us a bit about your journey with spirituality and meme artistry and spreading the gospel on expansive relating yeah well first of all thanks so much for having me it's a pleasure to be here um yeah i mean the, we're all we're all on such a journey you know through life <laughs> and I, I feel like our journey or we're all on a journey to spirituality whether we know it or not you know for for me spirituality is just you know, sort of expanded consciousness. And that's kind of a lifelong journey that, that we're all on. You know, there, there are probably people that don't identify as spiritual that are on a more of a spiritual journey than, you know, people who strongly identify as spiritual. If, if, if though, if those people are, are, are too stuck in their ways and, and, and not truly mm -hmm. embodying, um, that kind of expanded consciousness, whatever that means to you. So I feel like I've been on my own journey my whole life. And, you know, for, for me, my, um, I've always, uh, connected spirituality and creativity. And I, and I really feel like those two are intricately related because when I think about creativity, I think of you're, you're tapping your consciousness into some kind of an unknown realm to get some kind of inspiration or idea, which we don't know where these things come from. They might as well be another dimension, right? And then we bring back that nugget of inspiration back into the material world and then create something out of it, which to me, that's the definition of alchemy or spirituality is literally manifesting things that are not of this world into this world. So I, I I've always just been on a, a, a creative journey, exploring different types of creativity. And, um, for me, you know, creativity and artists have been, you know, guides along my journey just as much as spiritual guides, but I think it helps to have a good balance of both. So, uh, I've, I've studied a lot of different traditions, whether it's Buddhism or yoga, um, Taoism, and uh, it really helps to have kind of that mindfulness foundation for life in general, and also for creativity. You know, we can really only tap into good ideas and inspiration if we can really be comfortable, like sitting in stillness and, 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 and letting things come to us. So for me, like things like meditation and yoga and just having kind of a, a lifestyle that supports mindfulness, that just really helps with the creative flow and the creative process. So, um, every day is, is part of that journey and it's just, you know, unfolding little by little every day. And that's kind of the adventure of life. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with such authenticity. And I loved that you really touched on this concept of creating a lifestyle that supports to me, this isn't exactly what you said, but how I perceived it was something that persuades, per, that that supports your highest truth. And to you, so much of that is create, you know, creativity is your highest truth. But there are all these different modalities that can help you tap into that. But that being said, just because someone's on a spiritual path and doing the spiritual things, you know, it, it really comes back to intention at that point. And someone that, you know, isn't necessarily following these very strict modalities can be quote unquote more spiritual just because of the intention that they're bringing to their day to day. And it's the same to me with Tantra. It's this idea that you get to decide what your highest truth is and then figure out what lifestyle supports that. And like, that's to me, like living in an expansive way. So you could be someone that, 
you know, works at a post office and like, you're just excited to make something that is typically an awful experience, something pleasurable for people by just being, you know, a ray of sunshine. And then you go home and you want to be, you know, I don't know, like tied up. And like, to you, that's, you know, a sexual experience that is a sacred surrender and having that intention, you know, can be, more expansive and profound than someone that says, I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m. every day and fast and then do the seven hours of yoga. You know, not to say that that's not expansive either, but it comes back to what is the intention behind that. And uh, I really appreciate you, you know, sharing that element of the journey as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people, I mean, it's human nature. We get caught up in definitions and mm -hmm. we want to put, c categorize ourselves and, you know, put ourselves in boxes of I, I'm, I'm, I'm this, or to be spiritual, you have to be this. And a lot of that is just more an, a lifestyle choice or an aesthetic choice more than it is like a spiritual necessity. Right. Cause like you said, you can just be a, a post, you can work for the post office and live your life with compassion and empathy and, <laughs> you know, goodwill towards others. And that's more spiritual than someone who puts themselves on a pedestal and, um, you know, has certain strict requirements of, about who they'll interact with because they don't consider others as spiritual as they are, you know? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> just, you know, it's, 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 it's a funny, it's a funny world with, when you get into the, the spiritual community and yeah, uh, the different, the different cliques and tribes and, um, categorizations that people have for themselves. Yeah, this concept of the ego taking up some space in this world really feels like a branch off maybe of your book, you know, shit your ego says. So I'd love to, you know, chat more about that and any other, you know, projects or things that you're working on right now that you'd like to share to kind of give the listeners a um, contextual awareness of like what you're doing in the world. Yeah, well, my first book came out a few years ago. It was called Shit Your Ego Says, and it was published by Hay House. And uh, I was actually just thinking recently about how I I got a book deal with Hay House at the time while having zero uh, followers or audience whatsoever. <laughs> and and and, I, and um and, and that's a really rare thing. And I was just thinking lately about how that happened. And, um, I mean, I'll, I'll, long story short, basically I, I, I grew up in, in Minnesota and I, and I, uh, I took a leap of faith to move to New York city when I didn't have a plan or money or a job or any friends there really, I just felt like I needed to be there. And that was right before hurricane Sandy uh, hit the city, which was the largest storm in New York City history. And I had just signed the lease on my apartment, my first apartment, and the hurricane destroyed the building. And suddenly I was homeless in New York. Wow. And then I ended up, my friend um, knew of this place in this, there's a small island in the Caribbean called Culebra uh, that he had like a friend with this empty little beach cottage in this tiny little remote Island in the Caribbean. And he's like, well, let's just go there for a while. And, um, so basically I'm stranded on this Island in the Caribbean and spending a lot of time alone with my thoughts and I'm all my fears and insecurities are kind of rising to the surface and I've nowhere to go. So I'm just sitting alone with my thoughts. And I didn't really know how to meditate at that time. But I was I guess I was kind of meditating without knowing it. And I started to realize that these thoughts and these fears and these insecurities were not the real me. They were the voice of my ego. And there was another voice inside of me that was, you know, quiet and reassuring. And that was the voice of my intuition or my higher self. And I realized that there's this constant struggle within us every day between the ego and our intuition. And it's really which voice we're listening to that determines where our life goes and takes us. So I had this immediate realization for this idea for this book called Shit Your Ego Says. And it's really a personal journey of my own ego and intuition through, you know, um, just stories of my life and how 
I've navigated those two different voices and, um, and yeah, it's kind of like an autobiographical self-help book. And, you know, since then I, I've, my, my writing has really just kind of expanded. I've, I've always been, um, you know, like an artist and like a, a poet. And I've kind of gone back down into that, in that direction. And when, when the pandemic hit in 2020, I, th- I felt like poetry was the only way I could make, like find the language to make sense of what was happening in the world because yeah. everyone had a different opinion and everyone was in a, had a different idea of what was happening and why it was happening. And, the, the subtlety and nuance of poetry was really the only way that I felt I could adequately describe what I was seeing and feeling. So I really jumped back into poetry after a long time away. And I also started making uh, memes. And I started to make, because again, it's, it's kind of like poetry where with a meme, you can kind of say things that you can't say otherwise. Like I could... I could write a, a, an article about something, but there's something about the immediacy of a meme that you can communicate things that you just can't communicate otherwise. And I started to realize that memes are an art form unto themselves and, and they're a type of poetry unto themselves as well. So I kind of put together a compilation of everything I was creating, you know, in 2020 and 2021, a, influenced by the pandemic and quarantine and the chaos of the world. And uh, I put together uh, a book and it's the first ever book of published memes um, as well as poetry. So it's kind of a, a combination of memes and poetry and it's called how to laugh in ironic amusement during your existential crisis. <laughs> and, um, and that book is available for pre-order and it's going to be um released sometime in in october yay so this month super soon yeah this episode will probably come out maybe at the end of the month or early next month so right on it'll be it'll be available probably by the time this episode comes out sweet so based on this last year and kind of using this artistic expression to make sense of what's going on where are you now from like from your mouth what is going on in the world oh geez <laughs> there's so many different ways to answer that i think that i think that every so often the world goes through um some kind of a significant uh shift and a, and a time of rapid change and acceleration and i and i, and I think that's what we're, what's happening um i think it's I mean, anyone who claims to know exactly what's happening, um, they're probably going to get it a little bit wrong. And this is, and this is kind of why I like poetry, by the way, because you know, any any claims of being so certain or so definitive or knowing a certain thing, I think that reality is much more subtle and full of nuance and interpretation. I think reality is more like mythology than it is a strict textbook, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a little more like a dream than it is like a science experiment. So my point is that when people try to put their finger too close onto knowing what's happening, I think that the answer is always wrong. So in other words, it's not, we're not, we're not just in the middle of some random pandemic that's going to go away and then things are going to go back to normal, nor are we in the middle of some you know, grand conspiracy that some people tend to think we are, you know, I think that there's pieces of both of those elements that are true. I think mm-hmm. that it's, we're, we're basically just going through a, a shift in society and an acceleration towards, you know, a, a, a different type of world that's, you know, with more technology and more you know, I'll just, just, just new ways of doing things. And, you know, it's too early to say what that world looks like yet, but I think that this is basically, we're seeing the, the breaking down of old structures that, you know, no longer work anymore. They, you know, the, whether that's economic structures or social structures or political structures, 
we're seeing all the the cracks in the systems starting to be exposed mm -hmm. and um, those systems are falling apart. So I guess we are collectively trying to transition into whatever the systems of the future are going to be. And a transition like that, it's always going to be disruptive. We're just trying to transition to whatever that the future looks like in a way that is the least disruptive um, but change is, change is disruptive. Growth is disruptive. You know, anyone who, who's ever gone through uh, significant changes in their own personal life has probably, you know, had to hit rock bottom or have a nervous breakdown or an existential crisis in order to kind of facilitate that, that growth. So I feel like right now that's what's happening to us collectively. We're going through a collective nervous breakdown <laughs> and a collective existential crisis or a dark night of the soul um, so we can emerge, um, you know, as, as a butterfly after, you know, having died in the cocoon to <laughs> come out uh, in a new form. Beautiful. Thank you for that answer with so much, you know, breadth and depth. And I think that what makes you so attractive to so many people is the way that you perceive things as kind of seeing the extremes on both sides and still choosing to, you know, almost like make fun of it in a way that is makes it lighter and more approachable um and it creates a space for us to like be playful again in that way and i love it and i would love to move into kind of talking about how this community grew and how community will continue to evolve with the expansion of this sort of you know collective soul dark night of the soul experience mm -hmm. from your perspective i mean uh... I feel like I've found more community in the past year than I have in a long time in my life, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, online friends, you know, <laughs> because, um, but I don't know. I feel like, I feel like people are, this is the time for people to kind of find each other and, um, and to to not hide their authentic selves and their authentic truths. And the more I vocalize my own perspective and truth, the more I find people that resonate with that. And it's not a time to hide or be shy about who you are and what you believe, you know? And I, and I, and I don't mean just like to start shouting about your point of view down people's throats. I mean, you can, you, sh, you know, being subtle and having some artistry to your communication is important. So I don't just mean recklessly shouting <laughs> what you believe, but I just mean putting it out there and, and, um, and not hiding who you are. And, and, and if, if people, if you have people in your life that don't support who you are and the growth that you're going through, you know, it's, it's okay to, it's okay for people to lose, to leave your life. You know, it, it's like, I, one thing for me is I've, I've moved cities, you know, a number of times in my life. And that's been really good for me because, and not to, not to, you know, criticize anyone that's in my past, but if you never change your surroundings, it's really hard to kind of move on because you always have those attachments. When you, when you move to a new city, you have no choice, but to move on because those habits and those routines and those attachments are just, they're literally not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's been helpful for me personally. I know not everyone's in a position where they can just get up and, and move cities, but it's okay. I mean, we need to let the past die to a degree in order for us to kind of embrace the future. So right now, I think it's all about living in your truth, being bold in your truth. And if something's not aligned with your deepest self, 
it's okay to cut ties with that. Now is the time to do that. So we can, you know, cause again, things are changing quickly. I think it's really important to be around people and supported by people that are aligned with the same values. Yeah, absolutely. I totally resonate. And I also believe that many of us have such a fear around even figuring out what our truth is. Like it's so easy to not even be honest with ourselves because of all of the, you know, conditioning and trauma and fear that we're holding. So the first step is really to find it within yourself. And then even then it can be hard to share that with the people that are currently, you know, in our circle, you know, we have this fear of speaking our highest truth because it's going to hurt them. In reality, it's really only going to hurt their ego, you know, or their human and not not their soul if anything it will set them free it gives them an opportunity to gain new perspective and also if you're not speaking your truth you're withholding an opportunity for them to love that part of you like they actually could really love the part of you that is bold and is willing to make this you know lifestyle that might not be as in alignment with the conditioning that they received. So do you have any tips for people in how to get connected to that highest truth and then step forward and, and really claim that and share it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is, it does take a, it's a process, right? Like no, nothing happened, nothing significant happens overnight. So first of all, just have patience with that process. But it kind of go. It's it begins when it, when I talked about shit your ego says. It really begins with what are you listening to, the ego or the intuition? And like the ego is the simplest way to put it is the ego is more in your head, and the the intuition is more in the body, right? So, you know, the ego is. Uh, and first of all, there's nothing wrong with the ego. The ego is just a part of us that you know. Um, helps us navigate the world and knows, you know, tells us what our place and role is in any given situation. So there's nothing wrong with the ego, but when it's kind of um, in control of our lives, it's that that's where, you know, the worry and the fear and the insecurities tend to come from. So we tend to worry about what other people are going to think about us. We tend to worry about whatever social expectations are out there, whatever, you know, our, my family wanted me to be X, Y, and Z when I grow up and I have to live up to those expectations or else I'll be, you know, ridiculed. And living up to social expectations is kind of what has got the world into the position that it's in because those social expectations, it's kind of been built a little bit like on a a bit of a pyramid scheme, right? And, 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 and after a while, those start to break down, which is kind of, I think, what we're seeing again. So I think it's really important to not do things because we think we're supposed to do them or to worry about what other people are going to think about us. Because those people that are, you think are going to criticize you for being who you are, that's not someone who's in support of, you know, your highest self. And, also, you know, some people, when we, when we, when we come out of the closet, so to speak, as being who we really are, sometimes we're surprised by how much support that we even might get because, you know, a lot of people feel the same way. And sometimes they need to have an example of what it looks like to, to, you know, speak your truth. And, 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 and by doing it, you're giving them permission to do it. And there could actually be a ripple effect um, of doing that. Um, but overall, you know, wh whatever your, your, whatever your intuition is, is guiding you towards, that's a good indication of what your, you know, higher truth is, what, whatever that may be. And it's just, if, 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 if we're talking about people that are just beginning to kind of make that transition, I do think it's important not to make that transition to abrasively. In other words, you don't just have to like delete everyone from your phone and cut them off overnight. You know, it's like maybe you, you know, go 
try to meet people that you do align with and then kind of make it more of a gradual transition. Um, but, you know, in the, that kind of transition, it's, it's uncomfortable in the short term, but it's so gratifying and worth it in the long term. I think often we like limit our, our lives based on the fear of short term pain. But then what we get is like long term pain because we're afraid of going through the short term pain of change. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, I always say like the, the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing. Mm. And, um, you don't, you might not want to go through that rocky period of transition, even though on the other side, you're going to be much happier because you're afraid of that to disrupt your life. But the long-term pain of staying the same is much worse than the short-term pain of changing. I 100% agree with all of that. And I'd love to know if you have any like resources or tips or tools for people that are looking to make that first step towards kind of attracting in their tribe, their star family. Um, what are some pieces that you would kind of suggest for individuals feeling like a little bit alone in this time? Well, I can only speak for myself. You know, I, I think that it's important to you know, get out there and, and, and engage and interact, you know, for me, the biggest step initially was, um, after I had just moved to New York, I, I had never really done much yoga or meditation. And I randomly heard about this thing called Kundalini yoga, which I had never heard of before. I didn't, I had never done any yoga, let alone Kundalini yoga. But I felt called to go check out this studio and, and I went and it was weird at first. Everyone was wearing white and they had turbans and they were chanting during class. And I'm like, what did I get myself into? And that practice of Kundalini ended up giving me a foundation um, of being mindful in a place like New York where that's not easy to do. And it gave me kind of a foundation of a spiritual practice where I learned to do meditation regularly. I learned to, you know, just show up to class and, you know, I would always leave feeling so renewed and so grounded and so inspired. And that was not comfortable at first doing that, but it was, and then I ended up finding a whole community uh, in that studio. I even discovered a little bit of Tantra through that uh, practice because in Kundalini, they engage in, uh, white Tantra. So I, I, I had a couple, you know, long days of, of white Tantra where I'm just basically, you know, you're holding a partner and looking in their eyes for hours at a time, <laughs> which again, was not comfortable, but it was something that I, I learned a lot from. So wherever you are, I mean, whether it's in person or online, it's just really important to put yourself out there and to, you know, you're, you're not going to find people unless you, it's just like making friends, you know, you just, you have to be a little bit assertive and you have to go outside of your comfort zone to go to the places where the type of people you want to meet are going to be. And, um, that could be different for anyone, but for me, Kundalini yoga happened to be the entry point for, for me into the spiritual community. Yeah. I think that we forget that there's what 8 billion people on earth. Now there's, there's someone for everyone. And there's, there's likely dozens and dozens of people for, for everyone listening. And I also enjoyed that you touched on this aspect of online. Now there's so many resources to connect with people, you know, online, even if you don't have something in your physical container and you have a membership, right? The homesick alien club. Would you like to chat more about what that is, if anyone feels called to getting a little bit of community specifically, you know, in your space. Well, Homesick Alien Club is my podcast. Oh, okay. Um, so I, you know, I, I consider it a club because I wanted to feel like a, like, like, you know, you're, you're part of a club. Like, cause I think that we're all, you know, 
the idea of a homesick alien, I thought it was just kind of a funny idea of we're all from somewhere else, whether that's another dimension or another planet or heaven or whatever you want to call it. We're all just, we're all kind of a little bit homesick for source or for that, you know, for God or that true connection that we all yearn for. Um, so my idea behind homesick alien club was to build, you know, it's, it's in, it's, it's, it's in the beginning stages right now. I've got a podcast and I've got some homesick alien club, uh, merch that you can buy. And, um, and, and, and an Instagram page called homesick alien club as well. And I just consider it like, I want to think of all my podcast guests and listeners as part of a club together. Mm. So we can start, we can start there. And, you know, I think down the road, I'll, I'm going to try to build it out into more of a community where people can actually engage online. Um, I haven't figured out quite yet what that's going to look like. Yeah, there's already so much engagement in your space too, with just your posts and things like that. So I consider it a community, you know, already. Yeah, thanks. And I tried to, you know, I, th I, I think that, um, I used to always just use Instagram to like, you know, just post something and then whatever I'm sharing my art, but I'm trying to get better at, you know, like if in, in the, in the caption, you know, just ask a question and to, to give a prompt to your followers to engage. Mm. And then, and then, and then you'll see in the comment section, all the activity that can happen. And if I get a, I even, I love, um, I love getting a message from a follower that I think is a, it's either a question or a comment that I find insightful. And I love posting some of the messages that I get just not, not, you know, just to, you know, elevate the voices of my followers, but also just to give a feeling of community. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying my best to use that, uh, um, not just share my own artwork, but to elevate the voices of my followers as well. And that's how you can create your own community is by, yeah. you know, not focusing as much just on yourself and what you have to say, but let's just hold space for other voices and, and make this more of a, an open circle of conversation. Cause I think off we're, we're, our, our default is always me, right? Like, Oh, I'm going to share what I say. I, I'm going to post what I have to say, which is important, but just making that, sh that mental shift from me to we, mm -hmm. um, that goes a long way, both online and, and just in your, in your regular life. Beautiful. That's an incredible transition into the next piece that I wanted to touch on, which is you know, talking about using your truth as an opportunity to hold space for others to speak their truth. And I believe that, you know, pretty much everyone that's listening to this podcast has the ability to step in as a leader in some way, shape or form in their, you know, immediate circle, whether that's, you know, small or large or whatever. And so I'd love to touch more in on kind of that, like, holding space, creating container. And you would kind of just offered a really beautiful suggestion, but if you have any other pieces on, on, you know, leading the community or holding, not even necessarily leading, just creating the space for it. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. I think that that is definitely, um, we need, cause we're talking, we're, we're kind of talking about different, um, stages in evolution right because at first we're talking about kind of getting into the spiritual community and how to like find your footing and find your tribe and now it's more like how do you hold space for others once you do have your footing and, and, and your tribe and that's an important stage of evolution as well because i think that we need more leaders right now more like Re, like not leaders in the sense of business leaders and, you know, whatever the, the, the old paradigm idea of leadership was, we need people to be examples and to help really to help usher in the new world. And that's to help. And that means to help shepherd in, you know, new people that are coming into this community. And that's a very important calling that I think every quote spiritual person um, can step into. 
so you can do that in a lot of ways. I mean, first of all, it's just living by example in your, in your regular life and, you know, not telling people what to do, but literally, you know, living by example and offering help where you see it. But there's so many different, you know, I'm trying to, I, I think creativity is, a, is, a, is a, again, a key part of spirituality and a key part of healing trauma, honestly, because what creativity does is, is it connects you back with your inner child. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and it restores that sense of play and wonder and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, an awe at life. So what I'm personally trying to do is, is, is build out um, educational resources to help restore people's connection to their own innate creativity and leading workshops and classes and courses around returning to creativity, which is not only about making things and producing, it's also about connecting with your intuition Mm -hmm. and having enough rest and restoration so you can feel inspired. Because if your mind's too full of information, there won't be any room for inspiration. So teaching creativity is also teaching the, um, you know, the, the receptive piece of becoming a vessel for intuition and inspiration. So, you know, whatever your practice is, whether it's creativity or Tantra or yoga or meditation, it's great to master these skills for our own selves. But once that's done, I think it's important to ask, how can I put these skills in service to others? And how do I open that space up for, you know, I, I think that we're, I don't like the idea of, of, of gurus, but I like the idea of having guides, you know, everyone needs guides in their life that can kind of point them in certain directions. So I think it's really important for people to assume that responsibility of helping to guide others, uh, into, you know, uh, like I said, ushering in the new world. Yeah, absolutely. And I truly believe too that guiding others or teaching others is guiding or teaching yourself too. It's the best way to learn and you're nodding. So if you have anything you'd like to add on that. No, I just agree completely. It's uh, you learn best by teaching. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of, I'm, I'm not a parent, but you always hear parents saying that like when they, you know, teach their children something at various stages it's like they're relearning it themselves and they 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 relearn it from a whole different perspective so yeah it'd be uh exactly like we want to keep things to ourselves but it's really from the act of sharing and teaching that we end up actually we're not we're not only benefiting others we're we're also benefiting ourselves by by doing so Absolutely. And again, I love that we pulled back in this idea that there are so many different arts and actually in, you know, some of the more classic uh, Tibetan lineages of Tantra, there's like 56, I think, Tantric arts. And they're not just like people really sexualize Tantra, but it's not just like have like it's like basket weaving is one of the tantric arts you know and so it's like seeing that it doesn't really matter what you're doing it's more about the intention that you're that you're bringing into it and uh the in community can be such a big part of you know having this intention be a co-creation which i really deeply love and appreciate uh so i'd like to kind of wrap up with the last you know few questions here Um, And one of those is what awakens your arrows? What turns you on? What makes you feel erotically alive? Mm, Erotically alive. Um, I mean, for me, my biggest turn on uh, in general is just like music. Mm. Like I need to have like a vibe going of some sort sonically. And that's, you know, different vibes for different scenarios, right? Like there might be a you know, there's dance music, there's, there's sexy music, there's writing music, whatever it is, but just having some constant vibes from music throughout the day, um, really keeps me going. It gives me fuel for whatever I'm doing. So I'm always playing music. I'm always, um, checking out new music that comes out and get, and like, 
you know, listening to it. And that just gives me inspiration and fuels my spirit. Beautiful. Definitely resonate with that. And where can listeners find you or support you? Um, mostly through my Instagram. So if you go to words are vibrations on Instagram, you'll see my page and then through my links on my Instagram, you can buy my books and check out my podcast. Yeah, definitely give um, James a follow on Instagram at words are vibrations. Some really, again, playful yet expansive memes and content and again, engagement with the community. So yeah, thank you again, James, for joining me today. And I also want to express my gratitude to the listener. Thank you once more for opening yourself up to the idea of sacred sexuality with so much gratitude and love. Have a sexy and spiritual day. And I'll catch you next week on Talk Tantra to Me. Ta-ta.